hand over to Susan and Simon. Okay, um, I hope everybody can hear me all right. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very excited about putting this together. Simon and I have, have had a good time uh, putting this together, and um, I hope you're going to enjoy it. So I'm going to start off, and let me just say what the day is going to be. Um, this is the agenda. Um, so there are basically seven different um, topics we're going to cover, and Simon and I are going to take turns. So I'll do the first one, he'll do the second one, I'll do the third one, etc. And at the end, I hope we'll have a good chunk of time um, to interact with you and ask about your questions. All right, so getting started, I'm going to say how I got started. Um, well, um, IATEFL has had a huge, huge influence on my career. Um, it's opened so many doors for me and allowed me so many opportunities. But I started off um, very, very small. Um, I joined one of the special interest groups, one of the SIGs. Um, it was teacher development. And I was just a, a, a soldier. I was working on the newsletter, literally cutting and pasting. Um, and then when uh, Adrian Underhill, who has been one of the most important mentors in my life, um, wanted to hand over, I took over as coordinator. So what happened in terms of my getting to speak at my first plenary was that um, Ben Tisol, Venezuela, was having a really important big conference. And they invited the president of Tisol and the president of IATEFL. But the president of IATEFL couldn't make it. And the then the vice president couldn't make it, and nobody on the executive committee could make it. And they kept going down. And finally, they asked me. Um, and I'd never done this before. Um, I had, be, had given workshops. And of course, I'd been a teacher for a long time. But the most important thing is that I said yes. I took this opportunity. And um, I realized that they thought they were going to get somebody really important with a big name. And I wasn't at that time. So I was kind of playing a part. Um, and so I thought, how am I going to do this? So the first thing I did was I started talking to other people. Um, I, got, I talked to people who had given plenaries before. Um, Pauline Taylor, in particular, was very, very helpful to me. Um, she um, had given. She had a workshop for teacher development. And she helped me put together um, the topics. She shared some of her slides that I could use. Um, and I also put a lot of my heart on who I was in it and what did I want to say to these teachers. So I gave this, this plenary and was trying to, to do a good job. And they gave me a standing ovation at the end. And I later found out that they pretty much the Venezuelans are very generous people. And they tend to do that all the time. But I didn't know that. Um, I was so excited. And as soon as I could, I very calmly ran up to my hotel room and rang my friends in London, where I was living then, and said, oh, they liked me. They liked me. So the point I'm trying to make here is we all started somewhere. Um, and the first place you start is by saying yes to an opportunity that maybe you think is a bit beyond you. All right, Simon, over to you. Thank you. Um, First of all, um, Susan, uh, Mercedes, and uh, Jenny, thank you very much for looking after this. And Tessa, congratulations on setting up the fair list. This is a, a very flattering and um, a surprising invitation to attend. Um, but I'm very pleased to share with you my experiences of um, being a plenary speaker. Uh, without going into too much detail, um, I, I began doing plenary talks because I was invited by my publishers and by teaching organizations to come and do something that was loosely related to the work that I was doing, the publications that I was doing. And gradually, it, uh, it involved, evolved into something much more significant. Um, the lessons that I learned, um, well, there are lots of lessons I learned. But there are three lessons that I learned. Um, the, less, the first lesson, um, should the plenary be research-based, classroom-based, or, or book-based? Um, I think the most important thing to remember is you have to do something that you're happy with. So if your thing is research, then yes, of course, you do it on research, although it really does depend on your audience. And if you've got a, um, a, an audience of practicing teachers, then uh, it's very nice if the research can have some practical benefit. 
classroom-based uh, talks are always very, very popular and very useful, uh, particularly if they see people who are practitioners. But once again, it depends on the audience. Um, Book-based uh, talks, well, um, my, in my experience, the only book-based talks that people can get away with successfully are those by authors who have written a teacher's handbook or something that has got practical ideas, as well as a lot of theory that can actually be used in the classroom. The idea being that the talk will allow them to take, a, 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 take the, the audience to take a few practical ideas away at the end. But doing a talk based on textbook, which was lots, which was very often, is very often my, um, uh, the reason why I'm uh, invited to do talks, um, is very difficult. You have to get that balance between the academic and the commercial side because it is your publishers who are supporting you and indeed your invitation is, uh, is uh, uh, through your publishers very often. And you, this creates what I call the commercial talk where you don't mention you don't mention the book at all, but you have to talk about things which are related to it. Um, so the most important thing is remember the audience and feel comfortable about what you're going to say. Um, yes, uh, fine for academia, but here in the real world we're looking for people with common sense and of course the uh, uh, everyday practicing teachers uh, really are people with common sense. I'm not saying that uh, the academic world is, they're not, but it's, um, anyway, that's a strong feeling I have. Um, second lesson is talk about what you know. I gave a, a, a series of talks. I was invited to give a series of talks in a closed um, <coughs> seminar series in, in Portugal. And uh, I was invited to do uh, four talks, three of which were on my specialisms. And the fourth was on, um, on grammar. And my very good friend, Michael Swan, who wrote Practical English Usage, I asked him, what do you know about grammar? And he's a very modest man and said, well, not much. What do you know about grammar? And I said, well, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've got to do this talk on grammar, and I, I don't know very much about grammar. And uh, he said, don't worry, I've got this talk that I can give you. And as long as you do it word for word in the way that I would do it, uh, it will... Um, uh, it will get you a standing ov ovation and you'll be carried off shoulder high from the, the conference. Um, and of course, uh, it was a complete and utter disaster. Um, and this is kind of what I felt because everybody was, uh, everybody is a, a, an expert in grammar and there's no point in me at the age of uh, 30 or whatever it was trying to pretend to tell other people who are much more experienced than I was anything about grammar. I knew it was going to be a disaster when I saw a CNN camera crew come in and back to film it. Um, it was, it was in discouraging to say the least. Now the, the other thing that I also learned, um, and I know there's a lot of discussion about how men use humour to control difficult situations. But one of the things that I did learn was uh, um, to make him laugh. Um, <laughs> this sounds very flippant, very, very silly, but in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a series of very, very good seminar series run by the British Council in Italy. And I attended the, the, the first one and gave an indifferent plenary. The second one, I cracked a joke during my first few lines. And um, I suddenly realized that what I was getting was the interaction from the um, plenary audience that I would otherwise uh, get in a workshop. Um, it's a very large com uh, conference. We'll talk a little bit about the size of uh, an audience. But beyond 100 people, it's really difficult to get the kind of interaction that you have experience of in classes and uh, workshops. And I ended up going uh, regularly to that conference and reworked a lot of my material for, uh, um, for in order just to get the odd laugh now and then. But then, of course, you always bring it back to the serious things. Susan. Okay. Um, so I'm... It's interesting what Tessa's um, message in the beginning was that um, when she put together the fair list, um, she was thinking about the next generation of um, women, but this is not just for women, um, who will be going out and, and giving uh, plenaries. Um, and so this is an angle that I, I want to look at. Um, before you get asked in the sense of how can you put yourself in a position so that if you do get asked, um, you're ready to go. 
and but also thinking about um, organizations, um, teachers' organizations, um, conferences. Also, what can you do to, to promote the next generation? So. Um, these are ways that you can start to build your public persona slowly. So getting out there, running workshops. I mean, you're all teachers, and so you have that experience, but getting out to, and to have a, a larger audience. Um, if you, I mean, I'll say this again, you know, joining a teacher's organization could be a really important uh, part of your career development, whether it's an international organization like IATEFL or TESOL or um, a national organization in your country or a state organization if you're in the United States. Um, you can put yourself forward to say, I volunteer to open the conference, for example, uh, to deal with admin notices from the podium. Introduce and thank speakers. Um, volunteer to be the minder for some of the speakers who come from, from other places. Um, maybe instead of being the, the, the only speaker speaking to a whole conference, you could ask, could I share it with someone or could we divide up the conference so that you start with a smaller audience? So uh, developing public speaking skills. Um, this is something also that you can work on. Um, there's an organization called Toastmasters for people who actually want to um, develop the different skills, to look at what the skills are, and to practice um, with a, a group of people who are also interested in this. And making yourself available. Um, this is something where there does seem to be a, a gender difference. Um, I, um, men, it seems, will say yes to um, public speaking, to um, putting themselves forward more easily um, in the sense of building a career. And women sometimes think more about their other responsibilities and ah, they're juggling, we are juggling so much already. Um, how can we add something else? Um, it's just stepping up to the plate and saying, this is something that I want to do. It's part of my career, and this is my way forward. OK, Simon, over to you. Susan, do you mind if I just go back and add something about social media? Um, sure. The, um, which is to do with preparing before you get asked. I mean, it's very important to, I think, these days to build up your social media uh, presence. And there are a number of... Uh, celebrated women in ELT who are still starting out but have become extremely uh, effective through their social media profile, through Twitter and through Facebook, and often engaging people to respond to um, subjects of, uh, of discussion, to respond to their blogs or their articles and so on. And it really has helped many people build up a profile. The only thing I'd say is that some people, um, perhaps women uh, more than men, sometimes find Facebook a little bit threatening and uh, it can make people feel, oh, I wish I was doing what so-and-so is do doing or why haven't I yeah. been invited to that conference. So you mustn't let it get out of perspective. You just do what you want to do on Facebook or Twitter. Don't feel that you have to follow everybody else's uh, steps. Um, choosing a topic, well, your choice or theirs. As I said, um, uh, you know, really make, re when you're a plenary speaker, usually it's your choice. But somebody, indeed, even somebody yesterday asked me, would you like to do a plenary session on either business English or young learners? Now, both of those areas I've done books on, but I really don't feel uh, that I've got anything new to add to that. Um, and uh, as a result, I said, no, I don't want to do it. Uh, but it's important to think carefully about um, how you interpret any subject to suit the, the request of the conference organizer. Very often there's a conference theme, and one hopes that those themes are as broad as possible. Um, but um, I think you should be careful about what you agree to do. You do have to be happy, as I said before. You do have to be happy about what you're talking about. Um, what's the message? This is an interesting one, because sometimes 
I feel I've set out on plenary talks and I'm not quite sure where I'm taking it. And of course, I've practiced it enough so that there's a few convincing concluding points, but that maybe there's something else uh, that you can include to make it more focused. Um, one, of the, one of the only tricks that I think I can pass on in brief here is that First of all, it's very difficult to craft a, a good talk, but it's something that we all have to do, and we, especially if we're trying to say something new. And when I've done my basic preparation, I maybe even done the slides, I then write the, the um, summary or the article, which most plenary speakers are invited to, to write and, pro, and uh, propose after the talk, I write it before I give the talk. And I find very often oh. the focus of writing the talk, the, the article of the talk, before you give the talk is actually um, very helpful. And of course, you can then revise it afterwards if there were aspects in the discussion that, that, um, that came up. But I, I, I really recommend writing the article of your talk before you give your talk, rather than simply afterwards. Um, who is the audience? Well, um, <laughs> you really do have to find out about this. I mean, many teachers' conferences are obviously for teachers, but there are an awful lot of people who, uh, like in a, uh, the International um, ITEFL Conference, they're, te they're teachers, they're ministry officials, they're exam, uh, examining assessment uh, experts, they're uh, um, textbook writers, they're uh, publishers, they're all sorts of people, as well as the teachers. And um, although people who are not teachers are very interested to find out what uh, what teachers need to know, it's, it's, it's important to bear in mind that your, your, your uh, audience may be really very varied and sometimes you may need to just uh, think about who's coming, find out a bit more, ask the conference organizers and just uh, try, and, uh, um, try and bring it all together so that you can fashion your, your talk to, to, um, to, so that it's as clear as it possibly can be. Um, Perhaps one important thing is tr don't be freaked out by people who you know and admire in the audience. Really, there is a point when you just have to ignore them. So if you spot the, the, the person whose definitive work um, <laughs> you've been reading to prepare for this talk and sitting in you know, row two of the audience, there's nothing you can do, and you just have to treat them as just another member of the audience. And I very often found, in any case, those people are the people who are the very first to come up after you and say, thank you, that was an interesting talk. So don't be freaked out by your heroes, I think. <laughs> the lesson there. Um, is interaction a possibility? I mentioned earlier on that um, over a hundred, over a hundred people in the audience, it's really not much difference. To, you know, between ten and a hundred um, is fine, but after a hundred, it could be a thousand, it could be two thousand. I suppose the largest number I've ever done was two thousand. Um, and no, interaction isn't really like the kind of workshop classroom experience that you may already have had. Um, it's, it gets quite an, um, unmanageable, particularly if you're taking questions uh, as you go along. And there's always somebody who will try and hijack the event uh, if you take questions while you're, uh, while you're speaking. Too much interaction is risky, and there's usually somebody ready to, to take over your show. And, and indeed, often ask questions which um, they know the answer to. They just want to see how well you are. Yeah. But questions where you encourage people to raise their hand and say yes or no, um, is, that's a quite nice thing to do. And, and, and laughter, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, go for some laughs uh, if you can. You don't want to be uh, joking all the time, but a few laughs. Um, and have some ad libs ready if you can. I mean, the classic one is when somebody's mobile phone goes off and try and think of something to say. If you can ignore it, it's fine, but sometimes you can't ignore it because it's, it's so intrusive. I, I, I've often used the line <coughs> uh, to the person who answers their mobile phone during my pl plenary, if that's my mother, would you tell her I'm busy? Uh, <laughs> and it usually is light enough to um, get the, the whole thing moving on. Again. Um, oh, this is you, Susan, I think. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. So um, I thought in, instead of um, this is such a, such a, a large area, instead of going into it deeply myself, that I'm going to refer you to um, someone who's done a great deal of work on that. Um, that's Catherine Walter. And uh, you can get at her um, presentation in, in three different ways. Um, one is a, a webinar that actually she and I did uh, a couple of years ago. It was uh, Aya Tafel's very first webinar. Um, the thing is that uh, the first half of the webinar is me um, talking about preparing people who were first-time attenders at that particular IATFL conference. So it's, it's not really relevant anymore. So you'd have to go halfway through that webinar to get at Catherine's very interesting talk. But, and so this is the, um, the link for that. Or you can just go to IATFL and look for their um, slides. Um, and this is what you will find um, that she's talking about, um, different areas. So preparing the presentation. So uh, Simon's given you a number of, of um, interesting comments about that as well. Um, before you go, things like planning and organizing yourself. Um, when you arrive, things like checking the program. Um, it actually happened to me once. I was speaking at uh, TESOL, and Cambridge was sending me. I was in London at the time. And at the time, I was one of the very few Americans who was um, teaching for the CELTA, who taught the CELTA. So they wanted an, um, uh, an American to speak at, at TESOL about this, this British exam. And so great, you know, they were sponsoring me. And uh, I got there and looked at the program. And I wasn't there. And the thing was that I was one of the very first presenters. So I actually had to get to work and go around, put signs up, and get out the word. Um, and I wouldn't have realized that. So those are things um, before you go to the conference and when you arrive there. Um, what, she has ideas about composing yourself before you speak. Um, during has to do with uh, speaking tricks for speaking, um, pausing, uh, timing. Things are different kinds of handouts you can use. Um, interesting points about PowerPoint. Um, what size should the font be, for example? Um, things about your body, dress. Simon's going to get to that. Um, making eye contact. And with other people, um, dealing with latecomers and questions, which Simon has mentioned. So another way you can get at Catherine's presentation is to go to thefairlist.org. And there are three different publications there that you can just download. So this first one is um, Catherine's. Um, the other two are um, uh, articles that were written for the Teacher Trainer Journal, um, a checklist for organizing conferences. That's Marjorie Rosenberg. And a checklist for organizing and running a workshop for teachers. And this is by a group of people that were called the, the January group. Um, but what's particularly interesting about the last is they have a section on the special case of the FIFO trainer. And that means fly in, fly out. I've, I've um, used Jijo instead, chat in, chat out. And what's, um, this is really important to be thinking about. Um, if you are asked to speak at an international conference and you're just going to be flying in and flying out, you need to put special attention into what really would be useful for this particular group of students, uh, teachers. Um, not just, you know, what talk do I like to give. Um, so you need to think about what is culturally appropriate for those teachers, what's contextually appropriate for those teachers. Um, and in this article, they also mention things like um, um, the fact that you need to uh, keep a hold of your receipts, and maybe you have to write a report afterwards. And perhaps uh, you may even need to negotiate um, fees and different rates. So that, 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 that article is definitely worth taking a look at. So we're on to Simon. OK. Um, well, <clears throat> we, we've divided this, as we said in the beginning, we've decided this section uh, divided into tips for all and tips for women. Um, the logistics, the protocols and courtesies before, during, and after the conference. Um, I constantly find myself getting this wrong, and I do my best to get it right. I mean, 
One thing that occurs to me is that che do check if you're expected at the opening ceremony of the conference. Not, not every conference expects you there. And I remember being introduced um, <clears throat> at um, the opening ceremony of a Thai T cell conference and realizing that um, um, they were apologizing for my absence and I was at the back of the hall because I just <sighs> got up and had my first coffee. And I felt a bit stupid. Um, it's always worth checking if you're if you're expected to be introduced at the opening ceremony at the conference. Um, something that that but uh, this is a really tricky one. If you are particularly the opening speaker, uh, I think it's really quite important to try to keep to the published sh schedule, be, even if it means you have to lose some material. And that uh, involves a certain flexibility in your material which you may not have. But really, it's it's a nightmare for the organizer if the conference starts running slow after the opening remarks. And there's always quite a lot of opening comments. Jenny was admirably succinct this afternoon. Uh, but, you know, there's usually the conference organizer. There's usually, there could be somebody from the ministry saying how wonderful teachers are. And then there's a bit of back chat from the teachers saying, oh, well, why don't you pay us more? And, <laughs> then there may be the mayor of the local town who wants to tell you how wonderful this uh, this uh, this city is that he's a uh, mayor of, and then then there's the presenter, and then they have to then there's the introduction introduction to the presenter. And I remember on one occasion I was left with thirty five minutes for a one hour perfectly crafted talk, <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get back on schedule and. Uh, I had to think on my feet. Um, it's very difficult to do, um, but I do think that uh, it's important for conference organizers be, to keep to schedule if you possibly can. Um, and find out if you're needed at the end of the talk or later in the conf conference, and, and if you're not, uh, let people know how long you're staying um, uh, at the conference so that you can make yourself available in the bar or in the exhibition area or at the reception. Um, clothing, I, Susan, I'm sure you were going to talk more about this, but uh, I, I, I don't know what to say, except that I, I think it's strongly recommended. Um, uh, the, um, I think, uh, I'm not, I think what I advise about this is find out what the audience are going to wear. Um, and if you want to be sympathetic about you know, to get them on your side, you say you wear more or less the same kind of clothes. And if you want to be confrontational, you wear the opposite. And it's a, it's a sort of standard thing that I've noticed that the, that the most iconoclastic speakers, of which there are fewer these days, but they were the people who certainly, um, many years ago, were the people who <clears throat> wanted to shake things up and they'd always dress in a slightly alarming way. Um, Oh, this was uh, taken from a number of documents that uh, on the internet about uh, advice for giving presentations. They always say that what you say is less important than how you look, or indeed how you sound. But there's that final category where nobody really knows what makes a successful talk. And I think it's your your um, your creativity and your uh, your response which will make it a, a success or not. Um, yeah, some of the best plenies I've ever done that have been a success despite any of the, uh, despite what I've been saying or how I look or how I sound. So, <laughs> I have no idea what how that works. Um, your role at the conference, as I say, find out about, find out if you're needed. Something that's quite important is to find out about question time. Um, this could be a, a subject for a plenary on its own. and. Uh, whether you take questions during a very informal plenary or whether you say there's time for questions afterwards or whether indeed there is no time for questions um, and it's uh, it's tricky but you know if you're going to do a well as we hope to can finish you know in uh, 10 or 15 minutes there will be time I hope for questions um, that may not always be possible to negotiate particularly if the schedule goes out of out of sync um, I always like to say that if somebody um, if somebody asks you if, if if you if you say to somebody yes that's a very good question that's a, that's a question that you know the answer to uh, if you say that's a very interesting question that's a, a question that you don't know the answer to but you'll work it out as you go along and the 
and a question, perhaps I'll come back to that at the end of the, <laughs> the, the, the talk, is a question that will never get answered at all. Um, <laughs> And another thing that I think is worthwhile is just to work out what you want to say. At the end of the um, plenary, when somebody says with they've got their um, memory stick and they say, you don't mind if I take a copy of the presentation, you put six months preparation into and six months, six years of experience. So an awful lot of people um, expect all that work to be available and sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not okay. It depends on how you feel about your, your intellectual property. So try and work out what to say when um, people do that to you because it's, uh, well, it's, jo it's not just increasingly common, it's just very common all the time. Um, oh yes, this was a, 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 a cartoon that I saw about, uh, um, about questions there. Um, So, getting ready to speak, um, there's something that I'm sure other people talk about as well, is getting into the zone, which when, um, when, you're, when you're talking, it's really quite nice to spend maybe an hour, maybe half an hour before the talk, just focusing on what you're going to say. You might even be looking for other emphasis, other focuses in the talk that you want to give. You may be collecting some local information about uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the circumstances of the conference, which you can use in, the, in your presentation itself. Um, so really getting into the zone is this, this period of focus. When, you may have to be quiet, you may have to wander around a little bit, you may have to do all sorts of displacement activities. Um, and I think it's very important to think about the first two or three minutes of, uh, uh, of, uh, of your talk, which you'll need to learn so that you uh, can just do those two or three minutes and then just without thinking too hard and then just see whether you can uh, relax a bit at that point and go on from, from then on. And, and, and those first two or three minutes are extremely good for the audience if they're well organized, but it's extremely, it's extremely reassuring for yourself to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to get that completely learnt and understood and ready to deliver. And as I said earlier, try and add some local knowledge to your opening remarks. Um, while you're in the zone, while you're in the, uh, the, uh, in the focus moment, I think it's important to think about something or someone who is far more important than this uh, presentation or anything in, in ELT. Um, I mean, you could think, uh, it, is, it, it is ELT, it's very important, but it's only ELT. It's not um, life-threatening or anything like that. Think about your, your partner or your children or your parents or, you know, or anything, just to focus on something other than what you're doing. Bear in mind that there is a world beyond the, the, the conference hall. Um, and remind yourself that the audience and the organizers are lucky to have you at the conference. I think you need to build up your, your, uh, your confidence there. Try and deal with your nerves creatively. You will be nervous. Everybody's nervous. I'm nervous, but it's a question that your nerves are your is way of uh, respecting your audience. Um, uh, I know that uh, you'll feel like that, um, but just have to try and uh, sort it out uh, uh, as well as you can. Um, another thing is, well, how will the audience react to me? You know, everybody fears this is what's going to happen. I remember giving a plenary in Switzerland on one occasion when the, uh, <coughs> the eminent elderly organizer of the conference who'd retired uh, came in and sat in the front row and I spoke to the organizer and she said, oh, don't worry about him. He's very, very nice. He's a very sweet man. And if anyway, if he doesn't like what you're saying, um, He'll fall asleep. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And I hadn't actually got my opening comments, my first two or three minutes out of the way, when I looked at the elderly eminent representative and uh, there he was, fast asleep already. So uh, this is a fear that we always have. Um, I wonder whether you say, oh, it's so much easier for men. I mean, we've touched on this a little bit, Susan, and uh, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if it's easier for men, but 
probably the reason I don't know is that I've never been a woman, so I can't <laughs> say. I, once again, to stress, I think the, the, your nerves are uh, respect for your audience, and um, you know, I think it's a good thing to, to be nervous uh, uh, and, and uh, show that you're interested in what the audience are going to make of what you've got to say. Um, <clears throat> And then finally, the last comments, well, stay very focused during the open ceremony, opening ceremony. That can be something that goes on for a very, very long time. <laughs> um, go very, very focused through everyone else's introduction. This is a very nerve-wracking business. Um, and stay focused during your own inter introduction. There was another plenary once that I gave in Turkey where I had to sit through a piano recital, recital, and then one in Russia where I had to sing, sit through some opera singing before I could give my plenary talk, and, and it was tough, it was tough. And finally, when you're ready to go, stand up, take a big breath, and smile, and I'm told by, um, when I was having some med medical tests done, I was rather nervous, that the, the nurse very kindly just said to me, take a breath and smile, because uh, it releases all sorts of endorphins and it really does make you calm down. And um, I, I do believe that's the best way uh, to, to get control of yourself. Okay, to Susan, that's me. <laughs> right, Simon. Okay, so um, Simon was giving some tips for everyone and these are some tips that are particularly for, for, for women, especially women who are starting out um, giving these talks. So um, I want to make sure that you, you know what the FAIR list is. This, this talk is being um, sponsored by the FAIR list, by the Leadership and Management SIG, and by Nile. Um, the FAIR list is, was set up to encourage uh, gender balance at uh, UK ELT events. It's, it's, not, it's not a deficit uh, award. Uh, it's not trying to point the finger at, at, at um, organizations that do not get a balance right between men and women. It's trying to celebrate those who do get it right. And in fact, it, it is an award. Um, this is a, the certificate um, that has been given out, I think, to at two different IATFL conferences, now it's been awarded. We we award excellence in um, innovation and and publications, and this is in in gender balance. So um, I'd like to talk a bit about women on the stage, and this has been a thread going through this talk, um, and I'm just going to focus it 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 here. So as I've said a number of times, we need to say yes more often. Um, and in terms of training in public speaking and leadership, and I want to put that together with the saying yes more often, um, leadership is we have you know, something that we want to, to share with the world. Um, and we want to step up um, to, um, the, to the plate, step up to the world stage and, and share this. And that means getting ourselves out there. Um, something that we can start to do is to make a real point of including women more in our references and the names that we drop when we're speaking. And these different points are on the FAIR list. If you go to the FAIR list website, it is a real resource with lots of ideas for um, anybody, and particularly women, who, who want tips about um, getting on stage more often. We need to put more effort into identifying women. Um, there is a bit of a cult of the personality in um, ELT and at conferences. You will often go to conferences and see some of the same names. We know who the celebrities are. It's, it's harder work to find those, those women. Um, and, but it's worth it um, doing the effort. So there are some ideas on the Fair List um, website about how to do this. It's things like um, talking to people who have been to other conferences, uh, looking at the, the list of um, plenary names of, of other conferences on the websites, talking to people who know others, also saying, do you know anybody who you think is, is ready for this? You know, that maybe they could, with some mentoring, they would be ready to take this step forward. Cultivating a public persona. Um, 
That is as you would, as you do um, in any kind of profession. If you decide how you want to advance, where you want to go next, setting yourself up some goals about what the direction is forward, and that can be one to say, "I want to cultivate this. I want to go in this direction." Yeah. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with my mouse here. <laughs> there we go. So what I'd like to share now are the pictures of some um, women who are on the Fairlist website um, who have, have sent their pictures in. And I would like to encourage you also, um, if you have been giving a public talk, send your photograph in. Let's get a, a really good, it's, a, it's, it's called the gallery. So this is Ann Burns. This is Jenny Pugsley. This is Diana Markovic Hajdrahojic, former student of mine. Nikki Hockley. Kathleen Graves. Sue Leather. Jenny Johnson, who's the moderator of this um, this talk. And this is one of the favorite ones of me. So I'm going to close here by showing a picture of our Tessa Woodward. Um, and this is with Gisela Bors also, who is the, the designer of the Fairlist um, website. And they are all dressed up because they um, are on their way to the Elton ceremony. Um, the Fairlist was um, shortlisted for the innovation in local design. Um, so we're very proud of them. And that's it. And now if you have questions, we'd be very, very happy to, to deal with them. Um, Jenny, are you coming in to work on this? Or I don't see any questions. Let's see. I, Simon, do you see any questions? Well, I think, uh, I'm not sure if Maha Hassan is asking, uh, okay, who, do, who should we send the photos to? Maha Hassan has said, how should we introduce ourselves to you? I don't know whether that's a question to us. <laughs> um, who should we send, uh, um, Susan, can you answer the question, who should we send the photos to? Um, I'm not exactly sure how that would work. If you go to the, the fair list and click on to the gallery, there, there probably are instructions about how to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not, uh, I, I'm looking at the chat line and there are getting plenty of people saying excellent tips. But, uh, we want uh, we want some tricky questions, <laughs> so that we can say, "Oh, that's a good, so excellent question." Let's yes. come back to that at the end of the book. <laughs> Tessa, do you want to take Tessa's question, Susan? I do. You think that, do you think that being nervous is actually being too self-absorbed? That if you think about participants, right? Um, yes, I think that's that's a great piece of advice that um, Adrian Underhill um, gave me a long time ago, or he gives to to other people. Um, um, when you go to conferences, um, instead of thinking about oh, I'm nervous, how I'm feeling, but to actually reach out to others and um, to see what others have have to say, what they're interested in. Yes, can I just come back on that? Um, yeah. I, I, Nobody is a greater fan of Adrian than I am. He's an extraordinary man. Um, I think that's a very good thing for Adrian to say. I think there are people who are different to Adrian. Um, and I think nerves, I has, as I've always said, are a natural way of showing your respect for the audience. So, yeah, self-absorbed, yes, self-indulgent, but there's not much you can do about it. But it does make you... I think, do an honest, uh, a better talk. I'm very, very 
I'm totally convinced that if you're honest and show integrity when you give your talk, even if you reveal on occasions your nerves, then your audience will be will be supportive and kind. I'm convinced that is the case. I guess I also think that the audience is made up of fellow teachers. Yes. And um, if I have something to say that might be of inspiration, you know, it's 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 a it's a gift that I hope will be of help. I'm trying to be helpful. That's that's my attitude. Okay. Uh, Simon, do you want to pick up on the social media one? Um, except Facebook, yeah. I mean, Twitter is. Um, I, I I suppose Twitter and Facebook are the two which I which I use more often. I, um, Twitter has been less popular in ELT for about 18 months. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I think that the various Facebook groups are slightly more focused. The iTapple Facebook group is a very good one. I don't know whether the Fairlist has its own Facebook group, but um, if they don't, then maybe something we should uh, um, we should consider because um, there's there's enormous body support going on there, and I, I um, you do have to be careful about the um, about the hype of other presenters, the other other people who are you know, going traveling everywhere, and you're wondering why you're not being invited and doing all these kind of things. Uh, but um, uh, Facebook, I think, is is very very important. Twitter is a little bit diffuse, although. Um, once again, a Facebook, um, a, a Twitter uh, Fairlist uh, thread would be very successful, I'm sure. There's a, a, an excellent um, example of ELT-focused uh, Twitter thread on ELT chat, which is when every Wednesday at midday, um, uh, UTC plus one, that's... that's uh, um, uh, UK UK time um, and um, there's a lot of there's a lot you can do with um, with Twitter and discussion groups like that. Um, but I don't I don't know of other social media which would be would be more relevant than Twitter and Facebook. Okay. So do, you want to, do you want to do something about the group dynamic? Do you think a group dynamic could be a good strategy in a presentation? Um, I always try to um, get some kind of group work going um, in my uh, plenaries, regardless of how many people there are, if for no other reason than people can get tired of speaking to me or maybe I need to pause. Um, but more importantly, um, it, it, listening to somebody speak for an hour is a long time. It's a long time to process things. Um, so I try to give um, opportunities for people to stop and reflect. And it can be as simple as talk to the person next to you. What are you thinking so far? What, what's resonating with you? Or I can actually give them a task to do. I try to um, state this at the beginning of, of my talk, that there will be um, some group work that you're going to do. And maybe I will say, please introduce the person yourself to the person next to you. Um, you're going to be talking to that person. Um, I always try to, to do this. Uh, can I just pick up on that? I mean, yeah. I think it's a personal choice. Uh, I tend not to do it, and I quite see, quite understand that you do do it. I, I think it's a great idea because it allows you time to calm down and think if you are nervous when you start, and that's great. I just noticed um, a comment by Lilette from Mexico. I've attended some conferences and noticed lecturers start with a short story, and I think it's very useful and catchy for the audience. Well, that's a great idea for me as well because it's kind of Obviously, it's related to the subject, but it's 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 lightening the mood before you have to go into the serious stuff. And it's not only good for the audience, but it's good for you to have time to relax and get into the thing. It goes back to what I was saying. Prepare your first two or three minutes, maybe your first five minutes, very, very carefully, and then you can get onto the, the important stuff. Yeah, I think uh, Catherine gives the advice of, of doing that last, actually. After you've got the whole thing together, then go back and then plan the, the beginning. Um, so Carol uh, Reed is saying, what advice would you give to new plenary speakers about how to go about structuring their talk? And I, I think the, the very 
basic thing is, and this is cultural, is tell them what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then tell them what you told them. Um, this is, is um, this, this certainly works in the United States and we expect that uh, a lot of things will be, will have that, that structure and so it's a familiar structure. Um, so I think that's the way I usually work with planning. How about you, Simon? Do you have a particular structure when you're putting something together? Um, no, I mean, it's, in, in some ways it's very much more organic, but I, I have noticed, noted down something that I, um, for slightly less structured talks, when you've got a, a, a collection of ideas, the device which is um, uh, 10 new thoughts about teaching vocabulary or eight points about, or eight lessons I've learned about textbook writing or something like that, that kind of listing can, um, can be quite a, uh, um, it, using that as a, as a conference title, as a, as a plenary title, that gives, uh, sets up a certain um, number of ex, um, expectations. And it means that some disparate ideas that you may have, which may worth, be worth discussing um, and, and, and presenting to people, can be incorporated and turned into a very good plenary. So that, you know, the 10 ideas or the eight ideas thing, I think, is a, is a very good way of organizing uh, talks. It's, it's one of many, I'm sure. Yeah, it's also valid, um, not in all situations, but in many situations, to develop a work in progress. I know over the years that I was working on my PhD, I spoke about where I was every possible chance I had because I wanted to have some interaction with the audience. Um, so I could say, this is where I am right now, this is what I've discovered. Um, what do you think about this? Um, and then I would get ideas to go back. So it can also be um, a time of, of ex exchange. It just doesn't have to be, you know, the sage on the stage coming and I'm, I'm presenting, I'm the expert, I know everything about something, um, but to open it up um, and to say, this is a question I have, this is a, um, a puzzle that I have, um, and I'd like to, I'm interested in where you are with that as well. That looks like all the questions. What's yeah. The proposal for the CET webinar, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I wonder if um, I I know very vaguely about this. I wonder if either Jenny could come in to talk about this, or if Tessa could could write in to say on the chat right now about uh, the proposal for the CET webinar, which is a great idea. Or is it going to be one of those questions that you ask that you never get answered? Um. I can, okay, let, let me just read off what it says. So all those attending the webinar will have the opportunity to put in a proposal for a webinar of their own to Cambridge English Teacher. That's what CET is. If the proposal is selected, they will have the chance to do their first plenary via audio only webinar with help from a supportive CET moderator. That's a great place to start. So... And Tessa has suggested contacts, uh, contact her through the fairlist.org okay. website. So and Jen is checking CT webinar proposals. So um, Maria, I think that's the best place to follow that up. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we've enjoyed putting this together. I'm good. Simon, we have to have a new project to work on now. <laughs> I've learned some new vocabulary working with you. <laughs> Vice versa. We, 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 it's, been, it's been great fun doing it, Susan. I want to thank you very much. And a uh, uh, great, uh, great collaboration. It's been very, very enjoyable. Thank you once again to, um, to Mercedes and uh, uh, Jenny and... Uh, above all to, uh, to Tessa for setting up the fair list. I think it's an amazing achievement and uh, terribly flattered to be involved. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.